You knew it was coming. Well, a lot of people did, unfortunately. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Right Opinion, the home of a twat with too much free time. And we've been all over the gaming industry recently because we are gamers. We're going back to somewhere that I thought I was a bit more familiar with. And I say I thought I was familiar with because I had no clue about this bloke until all the drama broke around a month and a half ago. And I feel like a lot of people are in the same position because despite the fact that he was trending for consecutive days, a lot of tweets were more questioning who he was and why anyone should care. I mean, he can't be that big a deal. He's not even verified on Twitter. I jest because pro Jared, although not the most defined figure in the community, was sat on over a million subscribers, something not to be taken lightly. But to get there without so much attention on him must have been a fairly gradual climb. So for those who are wondering, I'll give a brief background into Jared's journey before cutting into the crux of today's topic. Pro Jared or Jared Narbenbauer started his time on the platform in 2009, working for the website of ScrewAttack, where he appeared to mostly be involved with hosting the show hard news. However, like everything, it would be silly to pass up on opportunities to establish yourself as an independent creator with your own ventures. So Jared set up his own channel at the time named DM Jared and released a review on the video game Two Worlds, the then relatively recent role playing game. The video was well received and he decided to push on with his content, covering more games and making series like Minute Reviews. In 2014, he joined Normal Boots alongside Jontron and Peanut Butter Gamer, which at that point was for game creators to post slightly less YouTube friendly content. Over the following years he continued to branch out and network, collaborating with other YouTubers appearing on multiple podcasts and leaving his mark wherever he could. Friends stick together and don't turn their backs on. However, it appeared that YouTube wasn't the only place that our good friend Jared here was leaving his mark. In his personal life, he had apparently developed a strong relationship with and subsequently married a professional artist and elf girl known by the name of Heidi O'Farrell, who is at the center of today's situation. Another character who is also in the spotlight is someone by the name of Holly Conrad, who Jared had began working with on Dungeons and Dragons projects in the years prior. On the surface, there wasn't too much to look into. Colleagues and friends getting on, right? Well, over the year prior, something didn't quite seem right. Jared had been uploading less, been a bit quiet on his front, and generally he said he'd been having some mental issues. Well, that's natural, and most fans aren't going to assume the worst, so people gave him some space and some time to work things out. Going from his conception in 2009 to the situation in 2019, Jared took 10 years to build a following on the platform that he loved, yet it was undone in the space of a few days. What exactly happened? Well, on May the 8th, Pro Jared made a post. This post entailed a rather understandably vague explanation that he and his wife Heidi O'Farrell were going to go their separate ways and end their relationship. Initially, this received support from many people within the community, offering their sympathies. After all, people don't need to know the details, we just know that when things aren't looking so rosy, a break might be welcome. A welcome break, however, it was not. And following very shortly after came a post from Heidi explaining that it was not quite amicable. Jared had blocked her and the last year had not been pleasant, including details that Jared had been cheating on Heidi with Holly Conrad, Jared lying to Heidi about him not even liking Holly, not letting Heidi be around his friends, and even offering Heidi a non-disclosure agreement that she refused to sign. Alright, so this is pretty bad. Jared's been a dishonest spouse it seems. Still, we've had much worse in this community. I mean, it's not like he's sending indecent pictures to younger individuals. Yes, in the hours following, many more allegations surfaced about his extramarital conduct and behavior with various fans. This behavior typically involved the transfer of explicit photos and although seemingly consensual on the surface, the fact that some of these individuals claimed not to be of age provoked further backlash against the gamer. This continued for a few days as the YouTuber lost over 20% of his subscriber count. People were loving it. It had been a while since drama had appeared this black and white and the pro Jared is over party was in full swing. But it suddenly came came to a staggering halt. Not because any new information was released. No, people had found someone else to cancel, our good friend James Charles, because people apparently can't focus on cancelling two people at once. Now with that said, as soon as Jared tries to make another move, it is almost inevitable that it will not be well received. 
However, during the James Charles fallout, many more moves were made. And given the James Charles situation turned out to be not as it seemed, you never know that we might have a similar situation on our hands here. There have been multiple additional statements from all parties involved since the drama transpired, and many have argued that they changed the perception of the situation significantly. Back and forth from Jared, Heidi and Holly, as well as people who claim to be the victims of Jared's rather manipulative tendencies. It's all a complete mess. With that in mind, I think it's fair we give the same critical, analytical treatment to the pro Jared situation, at least the one it deserves, and see what can be concluded, because if there's anything that dramas have told us, it's that giving it a bit more time normally helps at least. So today's video will consist of perusing through the statements, responses, and involvement of other people, while also answering some general concerns that I've seen brought up by others. That is the clear, concise game plan. So I suggest we jump right in. Are you with me? Epic. Let's go. Alright, if you've seen the situation going off in the first statement released by Heidi, you would have thought this was a fairly open and shut case. Heidi and Jared were married, and in most marriages that symbolises a bond that shouldn't be broken by adultery, unless both parties permit it. In this situation, judging by Heidi's statement, that can be drawn from the fact that she has emphasised that Jared was doing this behind her back, therefore implying that this was without consent. However, with new responses, more context comes into play, and I'm going to outline the counter-arguments before delving into these statements a bit more closely. So Jared Jared released his own statement, which went down like a lead balloon, but let's set aside how it was received and extract the individual claims. After the rather self-indulgent apology, he cuts into the crux of explaining that in fact, their marriage had been struggling for a while, and a few years back, Heidi suggested to Jared that they should exercise maybe a polyamorous relationship, which implies that both parties could see multiple partners outside of the individual bond. He claims that Holly was one of those people he encountered, and that because of this, he began to develop feelings for her. At first, Heidi was supportive, encouraging him to pursue a relationship. However, after he expressed his feelings, Heidi became very vicious and vindictive, and said that he was jeopardizing their relationship. She wouldn't let him leave and threatened to ruin his career. And yet through all of this, he had tried to be respectful and tried to break this off as peacefully as possible, without hurting anyone in the process. He could release evidence, but he preferred not to prolong the pain in this drama. He'd much rather just leave it and let people believe what they want to believe. Well, alright, it's a take we'll return to in a bit. With the lack of receipts, it is rather unsatisfying. However, it was not completely over, as Holly decided to come forward with her own thread of events. She firstly insists that this thread is not to bully or attack, and she does not want to spread hatred. She wants to spread healing. She has been suffering and couldn't speak out as she had to check herself into hospital due to self-harming thoughts. The crux of Conrad's story is mostly affirming pro Jared's side. They had agreed to have a more open marriage and this led Jared to develop feelings for her. Following this, Holly decided to publish receipts that Jared sent her with the consent entailed, allegedly from Heidi in early 2018. However, this is where it quickly went sour and apparently Heidi did not take this well and continued to harass Jared with highly threatening messages. To add to this, Holly also contributes to the narrative that their friends can all testify to this as well. They apparently have seen the abuse that Heidi put Jared through at conventions in their home. There were supposedly interventions to try and separate the couple, and eventually they did, after Heidi apparently illegally acquired content that she could use for her quote, revenge campaign. Holly then accuses Heidi of being the first person to make a false public statement, given the one she made on Facebook in front of friends and family. And when Jared replied fairly neutrally, she posted this screenshot allegedly slut-shaming Holly. Heidi continued to brag about it on her Facebook feed. Holly alleges that if Heidi really wanted to escape, then she would have left. She had the opportunity, and apparently Jared had really offered to resolve this, and he was the one who was trying to get away. Holly posts more images of Heidi bragging about it, and to conclude, Holly states the whole experience has changed her relationship with the internet, and she thanks anyone who supported her. That was quite a lot to take in, and I wish I was finished, but Heidi responded. Her response allegedly allegedly exposed the abuser narrative as being a ploy that Holly had concocted when Heidi tried to prevent the couple from having further sexual interaction. These DMs show Holly apologizing profusely to Heidi. She then published an additional thread clarifying information, stating that although there had been an agreement at one point the relationship was polyamorous, it was not working out, and they agreed to end it. And Heidi remained committed to that side of the relationship. She retains her right to revoke consent because Holly and Jared broke her trust, and they 
they have played it off as if there was just a different understanding of things. And now they're doing it again, but this time publicly. They abused the boundaries, and when Heidi decided to reinforce them, they couldn't accept it and decided to persist with their now adulterous relationship. In one final post, she observes that Holly and Jared's relative silence on the issue of the inappropriate behavior, rebutting Holly's earlier comment that there's a legal impetus not to mention it, and suggesting that their reason for not addressing it is much more related to damage control. Alright, so I think I've represented all three positions to an extent. As you can see, this is mostly a Holly and Jared versus Heidi scenario. And when you put all these arguments together, you create two competing narratives. Firstly, Holly and Jared's narrative. They agreed to have a polyamorous relationship. However, when Holly and Jared expressed feelings to each other, Heidi couldn't handle it and quickly became vindictive and abusive, wreaking havoc in their lives and threatening to ruin them and scheming to destroy their careers. She never provided a justified reason for reinforcing boundaries and yet continue to have relationships outside of the marriage herself, implying that she's just an abusive hypocrite. The second narrative is Heidi's, that after agreeing to polyamory, she quickly became disillusioned when they didn't stick to agreed boundaries and she decided to end the project. However, Jared and Holly persisted and continued to manipulate the situation and led them to this scenario which she has decided to present the world because she doesn't want Jared's narrative that everything is fine to just take over. The separate narrative to note is the one about the inappropriate behavior with fans. It is clear that there is some refrain on this and it's not exactly intertwined with the points of view that we are going to be discussing in this part. But don't worry, it'll all have its own part. As noted, both Holly and Jared are not making too many comments on this. Now we have condensed the narratives, we have to see how they match up to the corresponding evidence and analyze the language too. The momentum is firmly in Heidi's favor, or at least strongly against Jared, and there are justified reasons for that that we'll delve into. But of course, we'll need to separate presentation from truth. It is important to note that there are huge gaps in these stories that we will never know, and therefore we will be working with the information to create the most rational theoretical explanation. This does not imply truth, but it will hopefully represent an informed opinion. The right one, per se. Oh, ain't you just so fucking quirky. Now, I think we should start with the main man, our good friend Jared here. His statement is definitely the easiest to deconstruct. If we combine it with the original divorce statement, it creates a rather interesting sentiment. So to bring back this original statement, nothing appears too suspicious at first. But with the power of hindsight, some quotes do pop out, such as this one. It is my hope that we can both exit this marriage with style and grace. Why would someone say that? Probably because he very well anticipated a volatile response from Heidi. Okay, so he anticipated it. So what? Doesn't really imply much. No, it does not. However, I do find it personally unsettling that he says it in a way that implies that style and grace is more important than the actual facts. That somehow the handling of this situation should be judged on how lovely one is about it. And that's the thing about Jared's statements. If it was about style and grace, then he'd pass, but it's not. And in fact, once you go below his statements with any vigor, you find a lot of empty phrases that ultimately do nothing for him. His follow-up statement really demonstrates that. As mentioned, he opens with an apology, but then immediately defers the responsibility to Heidi, which is never a good look. And the reason is quite simple. People are not idiots. It's okay to be groveling and apologetic when you bear responsibility. But if you're apologetic while simultaneously deferring responsibility onto another party, then it feels like you're trying to falsely elicit sympathy while bolstering fake moral credentials. And that's what Jan's statement is. For all the apologies and talking about how bad he feels, it simultaneously pedestals his actions talking about how moral he is and all these great virtuous things he's done. When they're almost irrelevant. In the light of the information going public, he said that although he is tempted to show his side of the story, he doesn't want to fuel the fire. A statement that has been proven fundamentally stupid by the fact that Holly went ahead and showed evidence anyway. But on top of that, this isn't even a situation where you need to avoid stoking the fire. This is a situation where it's either public exoneration or the very probable destruction of your career. And once again, I'm not going to jump to conclusions. With this phrase, Jared is really pushing the limits 
of the innocence that I can grant him because the ramifications for not revealing evidence to defend yourself is so huge it's very hard to logically imagine someone genuinely innocent saying that. It reminds me of Jeffree Star in a way, but the difference is Jeffree's going to continue to be successful regardless. Jared's literally got his career riding on this. The only vaguely legitimate explanation is that he doesn't want to prolong the attention onto the other more serious indefensible claims. But even with that said, you think he'd want to at least turn some of the momentum against Heidi. And he carries on talking about how much he cares about Heidi and her mental health. But what about other people? Would he not want to defend Holly from such false claims? Surely her mental health matters too if she's checked herself into a hospital. Maybe Jared thought she could defend herself. I don't know. All in all, it's a pair of really stupid statements, which seem to say that he is certainly being rather slimy about this. Holly came forward with what seemed to be a more coherent story at first, which on principle does seem to complement Jared's story well. She provides the narrative that supposedly shows Heidi providing consent to Jared, thus aiding the polyamorous narrative, and also screenshots that supposedly show the mindset of Heidi in the fact that she appeared to want to ruin their lives. Definitely interesting evidence, but let's analyze some of the problems, because they exist nonetheless. The thing is, there are some points of interest here, but they're also missing a lot of content which all right the whole situation is lacking context but in spite of the evidence i don't think it proves anything conclusive about heidi's character firstly i personally find it rather strange that holly's the one who's publishing evidence that really should be jared's story because conversations exchanged between heidi and jared will obviously have more context that holly can just claim not to know thus almost absolving her from the additional context that might follow but she's still promoting them and i wouldn't have a problem if she was republishing screenshots that someone else had shown but jared specifically said he didn't want to show screenshots and holly wants to show jared's screenshots but all right you may be inclined to believe those screenshots if you've had the negative experiences with the person that holly expresses the angry confrontations and so on but digging deeper you find some more inconsistencies that don't quite match up the evidence is one thing, additional narratives are another. This can be seen through the accusation of Heidi's Twitter post. Holly implies the fact that she went quote public about this proves Heidi's the fire starter. Yet posting something on your personal Facebook account is very different than making an announcement to tens of thousands of fans, an action that was definitely initiated by Jared before blocking Heidi so she couldn't see the post. Now Heidi's Facebook post itself is not heinous, it's a public Facebook post that tells a perspective. But okay, following this, Holly states that when Jared responded to the Facebook post neutrally, Heidi snapped and lied about the situation and then posted this screenshot. But Holly didn't actually post Heidi posting the screenshot, nor did she screenshot the post. She just posted a screenshot between her and Jared, which basically proves nothing. I mean, she implies that Heidi obtained this illegally. What that even means, I don't know. She's some hacker? But posting the screenshot yourself doesn't prove that someone else posted it. Holly tries to further this idea by talking about how Heidi was a bit too gleeful in the fall of her ex-husband and causing this harassment with, quote, no evidence. But I find the statement grossly misleading. And although it is not a completely separate scenario, the main mob against Jared were, as I saw it, pretty focused on his other ventures, which is where a majority of the evidence was. Now, does this justify any mob backlash against Holly when her involvement was uncertain? It does not. But Heidi's comment was not about her. And although you could argue that Heidi did drag Holly inadvertently into this, Heidi was not the person who pushed the claims of inappropriate fan interaction. Also, many people took the fact that Jared had blocked her while making this statement as pretty suspicious. Once again, not justifiably against any harassment, but Heidi made her statements and I don't think she made them in a misleading fashion. The thread as we go on seems to get sillier and sillier. She then says that there were many friends of Jared who would testify this, who quickly went to defend him, but they were quickly, quote, vaporized by the mob that Heidi herself had mobilized. Once again, if they were good, well-informed friends speaking the truth, the mob would not have mattered. But none of them came across that way. Peanut Butter Gamer literally just replied, This ain't it, chief. 
One of the things that really bothers me is how people use their status as a victim of mob mentality to then invalidate the other's arguments. Mob mentality is not good, but it doesn't change the individual situation. It might make people unreasonable to an extent, but as James Charles showed, it does not make their stories irredeemable if there is enough evidence. Holly then goes on a tangent about how Heidi bragged that this was blowing up, which could go in line with the abuser narrative, but equally, if she was genuinely a abused, it would without a doubt be cathartic, and she'd probably feel good to see someone getting some justice. Then Holly suggests in big caps that she tried to steal his golden play button, which, alright, not good, but that doesn't disprove a narrative that she was abused. And that's the thing about Holly's narrative. If Heidi was the abuser, I guess these actions could further incriminate her. But as an abused person, as someone who was driven to insanity, she could have done that too. It doesn't prove that she wasn't abused. It only works if the premise that she as the abuser is established, which given the closest evidence being Jared's texts that Jared isn't prepared to release himself is extremely sketchy. And this narrative only murkies further once we continue down the thread and delves into the very sensitive topic of victimhood. What makes a victim? There are many definitions, some that make more sense than others. But throughout this whole retelling of the story, Holly was walking a very fine line, because outside of the third party DMs, she really has nothing solid to try and disprove the idea that Heidi is not the victim here. If you're not careful, you risk creating statements that may invalidate the experiences other victims face and even lending more grief to someone already suffering it's not a good thing to get a false negative on. I don't like people who fake victimhood. Make no mistake. Equally, that's what makes me particularly angry when people do fake victimhood because it is such a sensitive topic and many people will naturally have sympathy for you. But it's also something that you have to be very careful to comment on. Now, although in my opinion, the publication of the Facebook posts do not prove that Heidi isn't a victim, they're pretty specific in what they're implying, so they don't really hurt the experience. So they don't really say too much else. However, Holly follows this up with a bizarre statement that if Heidi was actually a victim or, quote, survivor in this instance, why would she carry on returning home? She would have fled. Surely, this is an incredibly stupid claim. She states in her tweets that this is, quote, typical behavior. And even if it was typical, that's not universal, and many people have many different stories about abuse. But on top of this, the abuse that Heidi references her receiving is not directly aggressive or violent. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's a technique called gaslighting. Now, I've spoken about gaslighting before. The literal intent of gaslighting is to make someone doubt their own judgment of a situation. So if Heidi was a victim of gaslighting, then of course she may well return back to the house of a person who is abusing her because she is doubting that she is even being abused in the first place. Even with those text messages, even if they were completely in context, they could very well be the text of someone whose sanity is deteriorating in the hands of someone who they want to love or trust. It doesn't make her a necessarily abusive person. In fact, the literal last text in one of those exchanges almost completely explains such a volatile reaction. She clearly perceives herself to have been suffering. She clearly believes some wrong has been committed unto her. Does that justify an aggressive reaction? No. Does that mean she was reacting to nothing? Does that mean she was the instigator? No. With this concludes the threat, and I can't help feeling that some details have been willfully omitted. We don't need to know all the information. We are not entitled to that. But instead of providing proof that she and Jared are both victims, she spent most of the thread trying to show how Heidi could not be a victim, with evidence that is at best an alternative perspective and other points of view that have still not been substantiated. What about this mysterious boyfriend that Heidi was allegedly seeing? A narrative like that would completely undermine the idea that she had wanted to return to a monogamous relationship. Why is all the groundbreaking evidence that would completely swing the momentum either too private or not worth the additional drama, despite the fact that Jared may have destroyed his career over this? But it's alright, because through it all, Jared just wants the best for her. 
Either Jared is the most foolish person in existence and is just so intent on Heidi's well-being that he'd rather lose his career than watch her suffer, despite the fact that if he's telling the truth, then Heidi is evil and therefore probably worth bringing down for the sake of future partners and people who are equally being implicated, or Jared's actually messed up. Now, if Jared comes out tomorrow with a video that shows the receipts in the same way that James Charles did, I'll be happy to admit I'm wrong. But it doesn't look like the same situation, because Jared has seemingly much more at stake in responding and yet is choosing not to. However, what the Tartin James situation showed us was that it was important to be equally as hard on the narratives promulgated by the accuser. What can be found in Heidi's statements? As said, at first it seemed like a simple cheating situation from Heidi's tweets, and although people may have been misled due to the lack of additional information and the constructs that make us assume such things, she wasn't necessarily lying. Over the last few months, someone had been having intercourse with someone else behind her back. As said, I can't tell if that's the truth or not, but it's certainly a more consistent story than the one presented by other parties. Like Tati, Heidi says she has proof that obviously she'd rather not show, but unlike Tati, she is very specific with her details and is also prepared to release proof when necessary. As said in my James Charles video, not showing proof does not mean you do not have it, especially when it is DM evidence. Does this mean it is hard to fully verify her whole story? For sure, but each story is an assertion and both stories in this scenario assert themselves against each other and we have to judge them on their validity. Jan's refusal to show any evidence and Heidi's forthcoming response to Holly showing DMs where she confronts them about the abuser narrative and seemingly asserts a will to remain monogamous cannot be ignored and although it does not prove other narratives, it should give us some semblance to judge the situation, if you wish to, which, let's face it, you do want to judge, you twats. Did people take Heidi's statements too much at face value? Yeah, for sure. But Jared didn't cover himself in glory by immediately blocking her. The vagueness of his statement was contradicted by the vividness and details of Heidi's. And confidence definitely lay with her testimony for a reason. Now, people have fluff responses, for sure. James Charles completely messed up his first response. Didn't mean he was guilty. But the thing is that he came back with a better response with receipts. It then put Jeffrey Starr on the back foot, who then pulled a very similar response to Jarrett. In his first reply, in spite of how terrible it was, James Charles didn't imply that he was going to respond further. Jarrett has done that now, and if that's his final comment, well, then he's messed up. There are no two ways about it, because if he genuinely cares for people's health as much as he says he does, he would be open about this, because this story has implications for people outside of the couple. It's not just about him. Heidi has continued to talk about the issue, responding to the claims when necessary, providing clarification and even some evidence here and there that neither Holly or Jared have completely commented on. When Holly called out Heidi, Heidi clapped back and Holly didn't respond further. When you make a statement, you have to defend it and Heidi has been fully committed to defending all her statements. The only thing you could say is that it might be beneficial for her to show more evidence, but she's got the momentum. Why would she? She's released screenshots when necessary, she's been highly interactive and not really shown any inconsistencies within her story and when presented with other evidence, instead of denying it, she's gone to explain why actually it completely fits in with her story and then presented additional context. I don't think all of Heidi's behavior was completely rational and proportional, but then if she was a victim of gaslighting, she might not be completely rational. And the fact that Holly Conrad might genuinely be trying to use insanity as evidence against the idea of psychological abuse, that's worrying. If Heidi's case is true, then it shows either great ignorance or dishonesty in Holly's statements. But either way, I think some people know better, and some people should have known better. And that leads us to our next part. Being nice is not the same as being good. I try to make that abundantly clear. And although I cannot affirmatively say who is right and who is wrong, my impression is that Jared thought if he was nice and friendly enough to everyone, he could get away with his betrayal and try and butter people up, veil his accusations in the unsettling notion of good faith. Knowing that the exposure 
of his true actions would prove them to be anything but. This may have been avoidable if his first tweet had gone unchallenged, but once he was called out, the whole defense was stretched very thin, especially in his second, when the whole concept was that he just wanted the best for Heidi, so wasn't going to expose her lies, despite calling her actions out? Why wouldn't you expose that evidence so that people know what she's capable of? Especially as people are believing her and not you, it's just nonsensical. And alright, this isn't the court, his freedom is not at stake, but it is the court's public opinion, and they have delivered a pretty harsh verdict. Unfortunately for Jared, it does not seem plausible that anyone is that concerned about someone who is out to destroy them unequivocally, and it just seems like he knows he's messed up, and thinks that sugarcoating his perspective as much as possible is gonna lead to people being easier on him. However, even with that said, the fact that his statement did not once address the most serious allegations in question was a prime example of that. Let's talk about those serious allegations. Now, a quick PSA, and this is more of an opinion thing, I don't think it's smart to enter sexual relations with your fans, particularly anything that is being conducted over the internet, because their own perception of you will be skewed. And therefore, although I'm not going to stop you providing they're of age, I would not recommend it, particularly in the dynamic that Pro Jared set up, which was basically this little corner of Tumblr initially in which consenting adults would share naked photos. It appears that all parties were involved at first in this venture, with Heidi openly saying that at the conceptual stage, she saw it as a body positive space for people and wanted to support it. However, it apparently began to escalate. He moved it to Snapchat, which is a bit more risky for a fair few reasons that we'll indulge ourselves in soon, and more people became aware. In her tweet thread, Heidi asked if people wanted to come forward regarding this, and oh boy, did they come forward. There can be little doubt that this is something that definitely existed, both on Tumblr and on Snapchat. It's clear that he was interacting with fans in a rather explicit, lewd manner, and I think that anyone who played a part in condoning this should definitely take note if such an idea is floated in the future. Did underage individuals see his nudes? Well, they have now. Some lovely content is on Twitter, and it's highly likely that, given the fact that this was all fairly accessible, that plenty of people underage saw his photos. But that's not the main issue. Although it's fairly irresponsible, given that a good proportion of his fan base probably isn't ready for that stuff, he can do what he wants with his body. What we don't like on the right opinion is when you manipulate other people's bodies. Now, as mentioned, although I don't really recommend it, as long as it's between two consenting adults, there is nothing that I can really judge as too reprehensible. However, when we reach individuals who are underage, then the story changes significantly, because although they may signal consent, they are in a vulnerable position to be manipulated, particularly online, when they may be asked to post images that can stay up there forever. As we're well aware by now, the internet seldom forgets. Two main stories come from two individuals, one known as Teacup of Chai and the other known as Swamp Borzoi. These two both level claims that Jared exchanged explicit images while they were underage, and he was aware that they were underage. These claims were posted on the 10th of May, a day after the original story broke. Teacup of Chai details a story in which Pro Jared exchanged explicit images with the knowledge that he was underage, and was coerced by Jared into sending lewd images. He believed that he was manipulated, and there is some evidence to corroborate that Jared was aware, including this alleged apology. Now on top of this, he reached out to Holly Conrad and Normal Boots to little avail. These tweets have been deleted since. In tandem, Swamp Borzoi's story was posted. This also created a similar narrative. These once again showed screenshots that appeared to show Jared responding to this minor individual in a very suggestive fashion. On top of this, the individual posts further evidence to show that the whole blog was rather inappropriate, including these archives from his allegedly minor accessible space, encouraging people to draw him as a succubus. Alright, not the worst. There's more evidence that he enjoyed to get off to people's nudes. Quick side note, but Pro Jared is pretty cringe. Nudes from sinners? Hint, hint. If that phrase isn't enough to remove the rest of his subscribers, I do not know what is. Back to the story. In the screenshots between this individual and Jared, it sort of mimics the Austin Jones situation in a lot of the language employed. Jared is talking down to someone in an attempt to make them feel more at ease, though certainly not to the extreme in this instance, he's getting exactly what he wants. It's pretty 
unsettling stuff. And because the allegations are a lot more serious, it would be foolish of me to comment with any certainty on their truth. Are they possible? For sure. They definitely fit in with an established timeline. And the fact that in the normal boot statement releasing Jared, they corroborate the claims they had emailed this evidence to them prior to the release of further content shows that it's not necessarily a bandwagon. This could mean that the people in this instance didn't do it for clout because they submitted this content before it all broke. But I can't confirm that, and they are two stories that have been fairly isolated in the field of other stories. And given the gravity of such claims, it's what we should have the courts for. With that said, I do think it's worth Jared responding to them, given how serious and substantiated they clearly seem. As Charles showed, if he is innocent, a No More Lies style video would not hurt him. The fact that Jared has gone out of his way to completely avoid addressing it, even when he had a clear opportunity to, is concerning. This chapter proves that Jared was definitely a very sexual person who clearly wanted to elicit fulfillment from others. There is a lot of evidence to prove that. The additional narratives of him being a predator are certainly compelling, but would have to be taken to court level standard to be fully proven, in my opinion. But what can be concluded? In January, I covered the fantastically fascinating topic of Toby Turner. His wild ride on the internet came to an unbelievable halt when he received allegations of sexual misconduct with very little evidence. Many people identified the lack of evidence back then, and many defended him. However, his career suffered because people became fearful to associate with him, and many around him justified it in their head because it kind of fit him with his assertive personality. It seems that in the last few months, sexual misconduct allegations have become a weapon to end people's career. And therefore today, I don't want to sit here and say that internet posts are going to prove someone's guilt. And although we should feel comfortable judging situations with less implications, this one should definitely be trod on more carefully. But as said, I do really think, and I cannot emphasize this enough, Jared would benefit from responding to it. But if Heidi's right that he's been legally advised not to, then it might be worse than we think. I think that's the problem with the situation. I and others have never seen an innocent party act in the way that pro Jared has. Within a day of allegations surfacing against Toby Turner, he released a video completely unequivocally denying it. And there was less evidence against him. Who the hell puts out a statement about their relationship and then completely omits the most important allegations? possibly of your whole career. I've seen guilty parties at more innocent than pro Jared and people will continue to think he's guilty until he puts some sort of response out. Every post since the allegations has been so manipulative. He's completely obsessed with not telling his side of the story as he doesn't want to prolong it. And people are all looking at the situation and rightfully calling it out as a vapid exercise in moral indulgence. As for Holly, well, it didn't look good for her either. I mean, her narrative is based around the idea that Heidi is this psycho abuser. The abuser narrative has been fully rebutted by Heidi altogether with other screenshots that Holly hasn't responded to, and the psycho side, although certainly unhinged, could still be an emotionally unhinged reaction to a revelation that she's being manipulated. Aggression doesn't equal abuse. It's a lot more psychological than that. And although I can't comment on whether Heidi's reaction was fully justified, because I do not know what preceded it. I can't say that that means she wasn't the one who was suffering because there's a lot more than that. And sometimes we will be emotional in times of suffering. Sometimes we will lash out. And given what Heidi published with her conversations shows someone drawing a line that appeared to have been crossed multiple times since. Also, the second half of Holly's thread just seems completely desperate to justify this point of view, to the level that it almost seems irrational itself. And it's not hard to counter with logical points that fit in perfectly with Heidi's testimony, such as the reference to friends, implying that they changed their position due to mob mentality and not the evidence that came out in the subsequent day which showed him not to be quite the wholesome creator. If Heidi is lying, she's just pulled off one of the most elaborate and well-planned out lies in the history of YouTube against two people who are so incredibly stupid they can't create a coherent response. And I'm more than happy to hold my hands up if that turns out to be true. But right now, it just does not seem plausible. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that Heidi's completely absolved of blame. Jared's little Tumblr project should have been flagged down at the start given Jared's career and status within the community. Although she states that she had backed out of it after a while and 
had assumed it was shut down, Jared definitely appeared to take it further in this instance, and it seems rather suspect that he moved onto other platforms that were equally or even more secretive. I still think there is more context to the situation that we likely don't understand, but I don't think any new information is going to absolve Holly or Jared for the role they've played in this. Heidi does seem like someone who has had a lot bottled up and does seem very committed to holding her own. Her story is consistent, and although she didn't reveal much at first and could have been a bit clearer with the details, she definitely rectified that in future posts. It's not impossible that Jared and Holly are innocent, but given their creation of some rather sketchy narratives that seem a bit too convenient that they then refuse to prove, such as this mystery boyfriend, it's particularly hard to trust them. Jan built his career off the bat of being a relatively inoffensive creator with a sturdy fan base who were patiently waiting for his new content. In many ways, he was a guy who was about preserving the image. He very carefully constructed a very neat house of cards, but out of the public eye, he was someone else. Not necessarily in his lexicon, in fact, the way he speaks is eerily similar. No, in his actions, he has some issues and they have manifested into something much worse. Judging from what I've seen, it seems the couple, Jared and Heidi, wanted to try polyamory to help out their current marital predicament. They agreed on some ground rules and established some sort of playing field. However, Heidi was clearly somewhat concerned about this, given their previous commitments to monogamy, which she had posted about. When she perceived Jared and Holly as breaching those boundaries, she decided to end this arrangement. However, Jared and Holly didn't want to. What happened over the following months is a bit of a clouded mystery, with both parties accusing each other as being the abusive one. Heidi as the angry, psychotic wife who wouldn't let Jared escape, or Jared as the manipulative, deceptive husband who trapped Heidi in mentally. This is a mystery that I doubt we will ever be able to fully solve. However, after it emerged with the pro-Jared post and the subsequent responses, people will be left to put together the pieces. Yet, given the strength of Heidi's statement and how quickly the subsequent allegations flood people's perception was obviously skewed against Jared. Everything snowballed without a doubt, and if he had additional evidence, he really could have turned this case around, but he didn't. There's nothing wrong with passing judgment on his ability to respond to basic claims of adultery. With the more serious claims, I think it's best to hold vocal judgment until there is some greater clarity. However, there are definitely claims worth replying to. And unless it's part of a legal strategy, as time passes, silence only hurts Jan's reputation more. That's his decision, and he's going to have a lot of time to think about it at this rate. So yes, that was the video. A lovely, lovely fun video. It's a pretty, pretty tiring one, admittedly. I, uh, I have been suffering a little, but uh, we are alive. We are not dead. I'd like to give a big shout out to the editors. They've once again done a fantastic job. Please go and check them out. I'm going to leave their links in the description below. I'm also going to give a big shout out to my Patreons. Um, Some of them are up on screen right now. Um, I have to give a special shout out to my uh, $50 Patreons, which are Jewel Angel 1 and Some Hullabaloo. Thank you very much. It is much appreciated. It really makes a difference. I can't emphasize that enough. And my $100 Patreons, Brandon and Evening Steel. Thank you to fantastic, beautiful, I don't know what other adjectives to use. I'm dying slowly out here. Thank you. It means a lot. It does genuinely mean a lot. It gives me an impetus. It gives me a motivation to make sure I continue to deliver these videos. If you want to hit me up, you can get me on Twitter at The Right Opinion, Facebook, The Right Opinion, official, uh, links in the pinned comment there, Discord too. I try and make everything accessible. Uh, I don't really have too much else to add, but I do hope you guys are having a decent, decent week. In fact, the only thing I will add is that I'm now on the Notify Me app, and uh, you can find me there too if you ever have notification issues with my videos. So we will conclude here. I'm The Right Opinion, and I will see you in the next one.